So let's go ahead and start with this here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share a graphic, and it's not a graphic so much as just a table of, <laughs> of numbers, and I'll try to give some physical intuition for what those are. So this thing right here, I will describe exactly what's happening. And let's focus, first of all, on the Balmer series, because um, I'll, I'll write this up, but it, it would be worth, you know, just kind of jotting down these numbers at some point. Um, and then same with the Lyman series and the Passion series. Now I'm going to unshare for a moment. But the, the setup here that we have is you have a tube of gas, and we actually do have this at Normandale. You have a tube of gas, and you put a, a voltage difference across that, that gas. So it's, it's a vacuum tube. We've isolated all, we, we've evacuated all the air. We've filled it entirely with hydrogen atoms. And to be clear, we filled it simply with individual H atoms, not H2, not molecular hydrogen. This is strictly, we found a way to turn it into just a whole bunch of individual protons. Each proton had an electron around it. So, actually, let me... And to be clear, what I mean by hydrogen atom is a proton with an electron. And this picture is clearly due to Bohr now, but at the, at the least we had the work of Millikan, of Rutherford, uh, with Thompson, and so we more or less understood what the hydrogen atom was about. It was an electron with a proton and nothing more. And uh, I have improved my setup. I have an eraser. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't have this whole time. Um, but so this hydrogen atom, when you apply a voltage difference, so I'm going to say delta V across this tube, what we observe is that very specific wavelengths of light begin shooting out of this. And, and as we kind of now understand, because of the photoelectric effect, we now understand that whenever you see a wavelength of light or, or like a, a, a beam of light or whatever you want to call it, it is in fact a single particle of light carrying a very specific energy. And based on that energy, it will have a very precise wavelength. If you know one, you can always calculate the other. So, for example, one of the most prominent colors of light that's given off by this happens to be... 656.3 nanometers. Another very prominent wavelength of light is 480, I should make that shorter wavelength, 487 nanometers, and, and I do need to confirm that because that's the one I, uh, 486.1, so close enough. Uh, 486 is good enough there. Um, a third prominent wavelength is, I think it's four, 434 nanometers. And I'm trying to, draw, trying to draw these getting shorter as we go to bluer wavelengths. 434 nanometers, and so on. So there are discrete individual wavelengths that are given off by this hydrogen tube. And nothing more. So, for example, if you had a detector that detected light that had a wavelength of 502 nanometers, it will never see a single photon of 502 nanometers come from this hydrogen. If you had a detector that was looking for wavelengths of 450 nanometers, 451, 452, it will never see a single photon coming from that tube, at least, with that wavelength. So this is what we call an emission spectrum, that when you take a single atom or, or even you know, a collection of individually, of individual atoms of different elements or molecules, and you somehow energize it, it tends to spit out light of not a continuous spectrum. It has specifically the wavelengths that are very precise and nothing in between. And so I think we've already talked about emission spectra, but this is precisely how we do that. And the cool thing is we can actually do this in, like, in a, a lab room on campus. So what Balmer, for one, recognized was that these wavelengths that we observe form a pattern. And um, Balmer, Balmer was able to, so we'll call it the, the Balmer series. Uh, this is a series of wavelengths emitted by hydrogen 
and these exclusively appear in the visible range. The spectrum. Now, uh, you could maybe argue that the lower end of these, so there's a few more lines that, that gets a little bit shorter, but there's a cutoff, and that cutoff happens a little bit below 400 nanometers. I, I forget off the top of my head exactly where that cutoff is. Um, once we get below 400 nanometers, that's, that's kind of, there's a wishy-washy boundary between what constitutes, in, uh, sorry, ultraviolet and blue wavelengths. Um, and just to kind of, you know, accentuate that, every single person's eyes actually have a slightly different range. So, you know, what, what one person might say is clearly visible to them, another person's eye might not actually be able to detect that. So there is no fast and hard boundary between UV and blue, uh, or violet. But, but given that, these wavelengths all occur more or less within what, what the range that our eyes can see. Now, let me just read off the next couple ones here. The next couple wavelengths do occur at 410 nanometers, 397, 388, and then there's a few more that will actually be on you to figure out. So, uh, but this is the longest wavelength that fits within the Balmer series right here. And we know that if you were to, for example, go into the uh, infrared, Pat, so this is just, it's still within the visible part. The visible spectrum more or less ends about 700-ish nanometers. Um, if you were kept ramping up the, the, you know, the wavelength, you're not going to see any other lines, at least, that fall within the Balmer series at greater wavelengths than that. So, what Balmer realized is that there's actually a formula that he can use to calculate exactly what these wavelengths are. And I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, I don't want to write it down quite yet. But so, Balmer was attributed, though, specifically for identifying the visible wavelengths, or the visible part of the emission spectra, due to hydrogen. Once we started to recognize that there are actually other parts of the spectrum, which, um, if you look into the history of science, uh, uh, William Herschel is one of the, the uh, who was an astronomer, um, he recognized that, um, and this is a whole other story, it's, and, and I'll, I'll reference uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos for this, but um, Balmer was able to recognize that when you take uh, light from a star and pass it, or light from our sun, pass it through a prism, that pretty, like, kind of like the Pink Floyd, you know, like, diagram, you know, we go from red and orange, and there's the Roy G. Biv spectrum. Once you go down to the blue, it kind of ends there. When you go to the red, it ends there. Uh, Herschel was the one that recognized if you have a detector and you place it even past where the, the red is, that it will still get hot. And what, what he then identified is that there must be some invisible light, um, and it was even beyond the red, so we called it infrared, and that, that visible light has the tendency to heat things up. And that kind of makes sense. We know that generally when objects begin to get warm, they start emitting infrared light. As they get hotter and hotter, yet they start giving off visible light. But so, so the, we had already recognized that, um, that light can come in invisible forms, and we knew that because it can carry energy, which we can identify the energy transport, even without seeing it happen. So when, when you start investigating that, and, and you have a way to very precisely identify other invisible wavelengths, we start seeing that the same pattern occurs at both the infrared and in the UV parts of the spectrum. Slightly longer wavelength than red, slightly shorter wavelength than blue. So the next one here was Lyman. So notice I'm going not in order that I wrote him there, but uh, the next person here was uh, Lyman, and I have no idea even what his first name is, or even if he was a male, but I'm pretty sure based on the history of science he would have been. Um, so the, uh, let's see, the Lyman series is exactly the same thing, except what Lyman did was he, he, he had the same setup, and then he used a spectrometer to identify what exact wavelengths are being spit out. I think that's what a, yeah, that's what a spectrometer is. <laughs> um, and then, and he identified a whole nother series of, of wavelengths that the hydrogen atom gives off, except all of these are invisible to the naked eye because they're ultraviolet. And so, in this case here, that literally the only word we need to change is visible to UV. And I have certainly not memorized this, but the Lyman series begins at about 121 nanometers. So, all right, uh, 121, 102, 97. And these are all, yeah, nanometers there. 
And keep in mind that the visible spectrum kind of ends at about 300, 400 nanometers, somewhere in that range. So, so very clearly, none of these would be visible to the naked eye. And so Lyman had this new set of, of uh, hydrogen lines, and he himself created a new formula. It was very similar to Balmer's, and I, I, I will give the caveat, it's entirely possible Lyman may have discovered this before Balmer. I do not know, and I, I claim ignorance. Um, but Lyman had exactly, or, or a very similar formula, that actually, in fact, looked extremely similar to Balmer's, except with one substantial change. And then we did the same thing on the infrared part, and that's where passion comes in. P-A-S-C-H-E-N. It's a good German name. And in this case here, um, these all go in the other order. They begin at about 955, 950, yeah, 955 nanometers, um, 1,005, 1,094 dot dot nanometers. And since the hydrogen spectrum really kind of ends, I'm sorry, which, since the visible spectrum ends at about 7, 750 or so nanometers, uh, the shortest of these even exclusively occurs in the infrared and they get longer from that. Um, and then there was another guy named Brackett, B-R-A-C-K-E-T-T. -T. I'll just write it here. And the Brackett series is really the same thing as the Passion series, except it's even longer infrared wavelengths, getting into the what we call the mid-IR. So the near-IR, um, this is something I didn't know about grad school, um, uh, be, because I actually did infrared astronomy, um, we, we kind of separate the, the infrared spectrum into how close it is to visible. And so the, the Passion series would absolutely be considered what we call near-IR or near infrared, because it's near to the visible spectrum, it's almost visible. Um, once we get into the range, so by the way, in nanometers, once you get to a thousand nanometers, that's the same thing as one micrometer, or one micron. Um, so once you get into the microns, and specifically more like, you know, four, five, eight, ten, twelve microns, which would be like 4,000, 5,000, 8,000, 12,000 nanometers, once we get in that range, we start calling it more the mid-infrared. So, Brackett's series fell more closer to the mid-infrared. Passion is in, in the near IR. Uh, Lyman is clearly UV. Brackett is visible. Um, which is, a, you know, to some extent, I think that's kind of a cool thing, that this, the hydrogen atom, the more we looked, the richer it became. And, and that's a good thing, because if this was the only series we had identified, I don't think the puzzle could have been put together. Because it's a really strange thing if this would be the only wavelengths hydrogen emitted. So... Um, at this point, we have, at minimum, and by the way, there, there's other series that aren't worth mentioning, not because they're not important, but just because these are like the third and fourth, fourth order, you know, corrections. Um, so at this point, we had a, a, a set of mathematical formulas that predicted these wavelengths. They predicted these wavelengths. They predicted these ones. They predicted these ones. And they all looked similar, except they had very slightly different terms. And it was Rydberg, um, and, and by the way, these series uh, essentially are the ones that you guys are going to be um, kind of discovering for yourselves in the homework. Uh, just to be clear, they had a set of, he had a set of numbers, he had a set of numbers, he had a set of numbers, and they were able to kind of each independently find the mathematical formula pr to predict all of those. So that's precisely what you guys are doing in, in your next homework. Um, but so once we had these separate series, it was Rydberg who came along and said, Actually, there's an even better way to, to describe all of these in one cohesive set. So, um, let's actually identify exactly what equations uh, uh, predict these lines.